Our first rule is a plurality rule. All right, so it's very uh, uh, simple and it's widely used uh, in almost all elections that I know of. Uh, so what happens is that each voter, each citizens, votes for a candidate, just for one candidate, and the winner is the candidate who gets the most votes, all right? Uh, even though the, uh, the, the candidate doesn't get the majority, it doesn't matter, whoever gets the most votes basically is the winning candidate in the plurality rule, all right? So I have two examples. Both, in both examples, I have four alternatives or candidates, A, B, C, D. And here I have the number of voters. So let's suppose three voters. Oh, I have, by the way, 21 voters. So the three voters rank A to B, B to C, and C to D. And five candidates rank A to C, C to B, and B to D. And then seven candidates rank this way, six candidates rank this way. All right. In another example, in the second example, the eight candidates, I'm sorry, not candidates, eight voters rank the candidates this way. Another eight voters rank the candidates that way. And then the remaining five voters rank the candidates this way. Well, once again, don't forget, we assume that these rankings are either common knowledge or the voters truthfully reveal their rankings this way. All right, so there's no strategic interaction here, meaning we ignore the strategic interaction. We assume that everybody truthfully reveal their preferences over the candidate in this way, all right, in these two different examples, because the rule, the plurality rule, is going to give us a different outcome in each different you know, example, obviously. So in the first example, the plurality rule is going to choose, remember, plurality rule always chooses the candidate who gets the most vote. So here, in the plurality rule, uh, example one, uh, candidate A gets how many votes? Well, candidate A is ranked the first, remember, it is true that the candidates, I'm sorry, the voters are going to vote for one candidate, all right? But the thing is, here in our setup, we don't ask the voters to vote for a candidate. We ask the candidate, uh, voters to reveal their entire preferences over alternatives, over the candidates. And then we tell in behalf of them, well, Three voters actually rank A as their top choice, and so they would vote for candidate A, all right? Well, again, don't forget, you will say, oh, hey, hey, I mean, maybe, uh, you know, some of those voters are going to vote strategically and then vote for B, maybe. Again, we ignore the strategic part of the voting, okay? I will talk about it towards the end of this chapter. So. Uh, a, therefore, gets 3 plus 5, 8 votes. Well, what about B? B gets uh, only 7 votes because only 7 people rank this candidate as their top choice. And so they would vote for B if they truly honest to this ranking. And then they, if they vote not strategically, they should have been voting for candidate B, right? And so B gets seven votes then. Well, what about C? Well, C gets uh, six votes and then D gets zero votes, okay? Well, who gets the most votes? Well, obviously candidate A. So therefore, the plurality rule is going to plurality uh, select or picks candidate in A, I'm sorry, in example one. So if the preferences are in this fashion, okay? So that's it, it's, it's very, very simple. Well, what about example two? Well, if you look at this example, candidate A gets five votes, candidate B and D gets eight votes and C gets zero votes. So therefore, in the second example, plurality picks uh, both B and D, all right? So 
Uh, well, basically, remember, a voting rule determines winners. Uh, and sometimes it's a unique candidate, as in the first example, but sometimes it's not unique, as in this example. Obviously, in reality, when this happens, well, I mean, this doesn't really happen, you know, so often because the number of candidates is, I'm sorry, number of voters is so large so that the, uh, the likelihood of tie, something like this, is almost zero, right? I mean, in assuming, for example, in the uh, United States, there's almost like 150 million voters or maybe more. And so, you know, the likelihood that, you know, each candidate is going to get exactly the same vote is almost zero. I mean, they may get very close, but exactly the same, it's almost, almost zero. But in cases where the voters are actually voting uh, and a smaller number of alternatives and the number of voters is small, well, then usually in reality, uh, people actually kind of use a, a tie-breaking rule. All right, tie breaking uh, rule, such as they say, well, obviously they describe this before uh, the uh, voters vote. And they say, well, if there's a tie between more than, uh, you know, uh, one, I mean, between two or more candidates, well, we're going to break the ties, for example, randomly, or we're going to break the ties depending on seniority, depending on gender, depending on whatever age. All right, but they nevertheless, in reality, choose some tie-breaking rule in order to eliminate this type of outcome. Because here in this scenario, plurality picks both B and D. All right, uh, well, you have to use some sort of tie-breaking rule to determine what, which exactly, I mean, is it B or is it D that is going to uh, be the winning um, uh, candidate, all right? But nevertheless, this is exactly how plurality rule works, depending on uh, the preference profile of the voters.